I'm Dr. Crystal Rousseau, and this is Dr. Stephanie Hess, and we're going to talk about the clinical applications of medical cannabis. Some of the goals of this this talk today is just to talk about uh, uh, common problems that you can incur that you can incur when you're uh, recommending medical marijuana, and how to avoid those. Um, discuss some possible. Uh, dosing regimens that for specific conditions that might be helpful and then also understand some of the lingo that people are using when they describe cannabis. Um, I'm going to start with a patient that of mine that came in. It's a 65 year old female with a history of severe pain from degenerative joint disease or arthritis and osteonecrosis. Um, her pain interfered with her all of her activities of daily living, um, really keeping her homebound because of the pain. It's so severe. She was uh, she had to ambulate with a, a cane. Um, and she just didn't have any quality of life because she couldn't go out with her family or friends. She tried multiple therapies and unfortunately she um, had no success. Opioids caused nausea and vomiting, which we hear all of the time. Uh, she has tried marijuana recreationally in the past, but she only gets relief for one to two hours at a time. Um, but she did get significant relief. She was referred to me by her primary care doctor um, for evaluation for medical marijuana. Um, history of hypertension, uh, pulmonary embolism. She's on a statin as well as an ACE inhibitor. Uh, she has a family history of coronary artery disease and she denies any alcohol or tobacco use. Now, all of these things are important when you're considering recommending um, medical marijuana. Um, the most important thing, the most important factor in a visit is the history. Uh, you need to take a detailed history. If you have medical records, then that's, that's even, that's a plus. Not everybody knows all of their medical conditions or the medications that they're on, unfortunately. But if you don't have that, then it's important to really quantify what they're coming in for. If it's pain or if it's uh, problems with cachexia, weight loss, uh, really quantify what their issues are. And then how does it affect their day-to-day -day activities? Does it cause, um, you know, are they able to go out, play bingo or whatever? Um, does it interfere with sleep? And uh, also their mental status. Do they have any history of um, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or um, anything with psychotic features? Because that's important when you're recommending. What medications are they taking? So are they on any um, over-the-counter medications or what specific medications? And that's going to really influence how, how you recommend. Um, I always ask patient if they have tried it in the past, are they naive? Um, what was their effect? You know, and how long did that last and what they use it for? Um, most of my patients that come to see me, they have, um, they have tried it in the past. And that's why they're here, because it does work. Uh, with this patient, you know, she, it worked, but it didn't work long enough. I always discuss the uh, potential medical uh, medication interactions with patients. Um, and then also, you know, is this potentially addictive for them? Um, give them precautions about driving, alcohol, pregnancy. So in, in talking to especially the naive patients, I talk to them about um, edibles and if they're taking too high of doses what what problems they can occur and then also since they don't know how it's going to affect them um, you know be very cautious when handling uh, heavy machinery or motor vehicles um, for my long-term heavy users I do talk about the addiction potential even though it is um, very low compared to something like opioids, um, which is more around the 20 to 30 percent range, but there is a potential for addiction. When I look at their medication lists, it's very important uh, that I pay attention to what types of medication and if they are involving the cytochrome P450 system for metabolism, um, then I caution patients uh, that they can either have a, an increased effect or a decreased effect. And actually certain medications can actually cause an increase in the THC effects uh, or a decrease in the THC. 
Um, but there is a synergism that occurs. This just illustrates more of the cytochrome P450 and how the specific chemicals act um, on the cytochrome P450 system. But there is a synergism that can occur with medications. So um, if with opioids, for example, or with certain seizure medications like Keppra, um, it can actually potentiate the effect of those, those medications. So you no longer have this one plus one equaling two, it equals eight. So you have this boon here. Um, and then, of course, there is um, a, a synergism, synergism that we're learning about with different combinations of the chemicals within the plant. So CBD and THC together, or CBG, and, and so on and so forth, the 104. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> um, very important when I talk to dosing, talk to a patient about dosing, we start low and go slow. That's really critical. When you have, um, especially a naive patient, um, you know, you don't want to really have them take a whole brownie, for example, because then um, they'll, they'll never, never do it again. It again. <laughs> <laughs> so I always tell them to start with half and, um, and see how that affects you and wait the two hours, okay? Because with each method, um, there is a certain duration of time that it lasts and also there is a certain time that it, um, how, how long it takes for it to actually have action, so the onset of action. Um, I, I talked to them, so based on their conditions about what would be uh, most advisable for them, inhalation, in the case of my patient there, it just doesn't last long enough, plus she has cardiovascular risks, and so we want to steer her clear of that. Um, she, wants, she needs something that lasts a little bit longer. Um, and sometimes topical is, is uh, very effective too, and absorbed, like the bath bomb. <laughs> But it's important to set up a treatment goal with patients and uh, have them really document what they're using and what their effects were. And um, on the previous slides that I had, it, I talk about you know, starting low, so with both CBD and THC, um, starting low, write down how you feel. Um, also. Uh, write down what your goal is. Are you trying to get more sleep? Are you trying to reduce that pain? I did have a patient that came in to me that talked to me about, um, uh, he talked to me, he came in and he said, I'm using concentrates and I just bought a new rig and I was dabbing and I didn't, um, it didn't really work for me. I was really concerned with it and I bought, a, I bought one with a quartz nail. Is that better than titanium? And I said, Okay, could you use some layman's terms for me? <laughs> so um, I, I, after he explained what he was talking about, I looked up some, some of the important, I looked up some of the important terminology. There we go. And, you know, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but indica and sativa, um, you know, what is known and when they go to, when patients go to dispensaries, is that indica um, it will be more sedating for them, sativa will be more activating, so even though they may be chemically, uh, uh, the structure may be the same, uh, people have um, anecdotal, <coughs> anecdotally different responses. Um, uh, also talking about concentrates, it's really important to know what type of concentrates they're using because there's wax, shatter, live resin, rosin, um, hash, hash oil, hashish, <laughs> butane hash, you know. But basically what happens is um, that concentration can be anywhere from 20% THC up to 95%. So just having that conversation with the patients is very important. Dabbing is the act of using the concentrate. The rig is the water, water pipe. The nail is, can be titanium or quartz. And just having these, these conversations is very important. Um, back to the case really quickly. I know time is running out. <laughs> uh, important things to, uh, for, to consider with this patient in particular that she was an experienced user, so I could use a little bit of higher dose with her. Um, but it's still, I want her to kind of um, 
start low because she doesn't know how it's going to affect her and also um, keep track of this. Um, she's getting that short duration of relief, so I want her to use something that's a little bit longer, like tincture or edibles. Um, she ambulates with a cane, so uh, she's a fall risk, so you definitely want to start with a lower dose. Um, high blood pressure, again, the cardiovascular effects, uh, or <coughs> potential cardiovascular effects, so uh, avoiding smoking if she can. Um, and then she's on simvastatin, which can elevate um, liver enzymes, and there is some evidence to show that uh, uh, marijuana can have some effect on the liver as well, and so following those very closely is important. So uh, to follow right from Crystal, the way that we would then go to make a recommendation for a patient is to go on the Colorado Medical Registry System, and um, in Colorado, we have these listed indications for medical marijuana use. Um, and compared to other states, our list is, is short. But um, what's nice is that it was legalized in 2012, and so now we have a situation that's more of a right to try. So my experience is really that my patients are coming and reporting use and asking for direction. And so again, just thank you for the contribution on health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. We have to keep as physicians trying our best to stay up to date with limited research and review current state of evidence and review current recommendations that are actually supported um, more than anecdotal. Mm -hmm. So as a provider in this community, um, I went to this conference last year and I was really impressed with Dr. Leahy's lecture and I see a lot of patients that struggle with neurodegenerative problems and so I approached Laura Borgelt who spoke last year and I asked her because we had trained with her what her impression was of um, greater than 65 year old use almost the right to try for CBD um, based products and some THC based products for some neurodegenerative issues and she and I and Crystal all sat down one day and really talked about this concept of a broken brain. And um, House Bill 1263 kind of goes right on that. If you have this autistic child, the, the brain's already broken. If you have pediatric seizure disorder, the brain's already broken. So then you can maybe go to this right to try. Um, dosing is tricky because we don't have a lot of research to support correct dosing. But um, microdosing and standard dosing and um, macrodosing in that slow titration pattern seems obvious like we would do with any other medications to diminish adverse events and uh, watch for optimal therapeutic range. So this just reflects a study that's proven um, reduction of polypharmacy. So with states that actually have medical marijuana programs that you have diminished prescription medication use and you also have um, diminished spending. So for my patients over 65, we know that morbidity and mortality is directly related to number of medications prescribed. And so if we can actually have reduction of polypharmacy, that in and of itself would be amazing. So this is just a show of hands of what people think is the most common reason for medical marijuana use in Colorado. Um, uh, I think that all of these are indications that I've had patients report about success using, but the most common is pain. And this goes back to the previous lectures, that it's the most common reason people are using and we're also in an opiate crisis. So during a time where, as a provider, I'm being asked and really pressured to do Suboxone, I find it ironic that we're not looking at medications that have more of this synergistic potential um, and maybe even CBD predominant medications to diminish addiction risk. Um, these are just a couple um, systemic review meta-analysis. Obviously, we don't have great research, so we depend on whatever we're able to start to gather some data. And this just show the median effective dose for codeine. If you, if you put it with THC, the dose needed for pain relief is 9.5 times lower than a median effective dose with codeine alone. And then also the same, a median effective dose with morphine is 
if you combine that with THC is 3.6 times lower than what's needed if you're using morphine alone. So some early data that shows that synergism and cannabinoid efficacy for pain relief. Um, this is another retrospective cross-sectional survey. So again, the data is what we can review, um, not randomized placebo-controlled trials, but obviously after these presentations, we know why <laughs> those are hard to come by. But um, again, showing almost a 64% decrease in opioid use with 244 medical cannabis patients with chronic pain in Michigan that were evaluated. And also these patients report um, a better quality of life uh, fewer side effects and decreased, obviously decreased opiate use. So the goal for physicians always is to try to use a minimal amount of whatever medication it is to achieve a maximal benefit. So that's not unique to this <laughs> drug category. And, um, but what is in interesting is this idea that tolerance may indicate that you've exceeded your um, therapeutic dose. And so it draws upon that Gaussian curve where you increase your dose and whatever you're targeting where it says anti-inflammatory there, whether it's pain or anti-inflammation or um, agitation or anxiety or sleep, whatever it is you're trying to improve upon and watching a titration, you self-titrate unfortunately a lot, a lot of the time because we don't have a lot of data. And then if you start to lose benefit and you're trying to escalate dose, then you've probably already gone beyond is the idea that exists with dosing, especially THC. So this is the cannabis sensitization six-day protocol for inhalational therapy. Healer.com is a great resource um, for patients using medical cannabis or using recreationally for medical reasons. Um, so the reason to try this sensitization six-day protocol is to you'll save money if you're using way too much THC that you don't even need it you're beyond your therapeutic index then you would save money if you back down um, you would increase your desired medical benefits because the idea is your optimal dose has um, maybe been missed and you're not even getting the benefits you're looking to get and that you would decrease negative side effects because we know there's more side effects as THC dose goes up higher and this is just a quick summary um, of that. It says 48 hour fast is the most important piece. So really that you do that intentionally, that you have a plan. Um, this is a difficult step because behavioral change or decision to make a change is, is difficult. But do, knowing that it's only 48 hours, I think is reassuring. Stay hydrated, exercise, do things you enjoy, do some meditation if you're able. Um, there's some supportive foods that are listed on healer.com and supplements that may help that 48-hour fast. Then when you break the fast, the entire idea of titration is based on one inhalation waiting five minutes after that one inhalation. So, um, and then giving yourself a score on how you're feeling on your inner inventory. And they're really looking on how your breathing is, what your body comfort is, and what your mood is. And very rarely do patients require more than three inhalations during this titration to desired effect. And what they're looking for is minimum effect. So any effect at all, you stop there, you go about your day. Are you doing better with the things functionally that you were intending to do better with? Have you achieved a goal of a relative improvement to get you back to that functioning status? And move on. Sometimes up to three times a day people are dosing, but again, to always do your inner inventory, notice your breath, notice how your body feels, noticing your mood, and waiting five minutes after each inhalation. And then on the day six, the idea would be that you would um, always go one less to see if you still get some maximal dosage and maximal optimal effect. And um, I do always encourage patients to try to switch from inhalational therapy. And, Again, we just don't have enough data on safety for vasculopath patients. I mean, I, I don't feel comfortable with um, people that are already challenged from a cardiovascular standpoint encouraging an inhalational therapy. Um, so what we also can do is we have more precise dosing with tinctures or other um, edibles. We have more discrete usage. Um, it's more economical because we do have people reporting that you lose the inhalational therapy and the exhale, so you've actually lost some of your um, component of medicine, where the same amount of plant might last you for six months instead of two if you're 
making a tincture out of it. Um, you diminish the risk for respiratory irritation. And you could always PRN with inhalational therapy because of that titration concept that you would take an inhalation and wait five minutes and do an inner inventory and see if the symptoms you're targeting are improving. And then you could adjust your edible or um, tincture dosage. But the idea would be to get better benefit with more precise dosing and um, longer efficacy. The, the orals have longer efficacy than the inhalational therapies as well. And then finally, I want to end on opioid addiction because it affects every single one of us. And um, it's really something as a medical community that we created. Um, and it's very uh, heart-wrenching to me as a provider that that would ever be a part of my contribution. So. We have Yasmin Hurd working on this. I love the title, Cannabidiol, Swinging the Marijuana Pendulum from Weed to Medication to Treat the Opioid Epidemic. And we already know that CBD reduces heroin-seeking behavior in animals. It reduces the anxiety, which is a really big component of relapse and abuse. Um, it reduces rewarding properties of opioid drugs, and it reduces withdrawal symptoms from opiates. And actually, there are some, there's some early evidence that it might even help in humans to reduce that cue-induced craving. So we'll open it for questions.